I almost didn't recognize you without the rhino mask on. Uh, maybe that's yeah. Maybe that's where we should start uh, because you were in the news last week and, and you were revealed on the Masked Singer. How did that go? How did that get pitched to you? And, and how did you like that experience? Yeah, it was a trip, man. Um, you know, so basically last December, uh, the idea came across and uh, my initial reaction was, you know, we were we were pregnant, right? My wife, well, my wife is pregnant, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, I say yeah. we, I don't even know if that's right. But we were, <laughs> you know, due late March. And so, and we already have two sons. So I just knew that the timing looked like it was going to work. But, you know, um, if the baby came early, which that's always a, a possibility, it might be tricky. And so I ended up agreeing to it. And uh, I, I realized if I went all the way, we would still have some time before the baby was born. Um, never expected to go as far as I did, but our baby actually came five weeks early. And so it was very tricky coordinating. And I actually had to fly back on my second to last performance in the middle of the night to get here, you know, hours before the baby was born and then, you know, not sleep for two days and then fly back and do my last song on the show. So it was, it was a lot, but it was such a fun experience, man. And I imagine part of the experience, right, the upside and the selling point for you, a little bit of exposure, right, puts you in front of a national audience and, and the musical background, but maybe also the opportunity to kind of rub elbows and shoulders with, with people in the business and just kind of network a bit. Is that is that pretty much it? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've realized that the music industry is a pretty hard industry to get over in, right? Um you know, you have people that have been doing it their whole lives. And so, you know, I'm kind of a newbie going into it you know, only for the last four or five years. Sure. But um, for me, it was more of like, this is an incredible challenge. I want to just see if I can even pull this off with any success at all. <laughs> um, and the reality is, you know, it's on such lockdown as far as, you know, secrecy on the mass Singer set that right. I-, I couldn't network or talk to anyone. I mean, there was literally like, I want to say five or eight people on the entire TV show that even knew who I was, most people that were working on the show, you know, I'm walking around in a sweatshirt that says, don't talk to me. And I have this huge, like silver looking kind of reflective mask everywhere I go with my hands in my pockets and gloves on. So, um, you know, I couldn't really talk to anybody or, or do any of that, but more than that, it was just, it was such a cool challenge, man. But as the show was going on, obviously it had been pre taped. So you were already you know, done with it, but you're getting probably so many phone calls. I read that Matt Cain was all over your case about knowing yeah. <laughs> it's you, Barry. How many other people were, were kind of doing that? There must have been a bunch. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Matt was Matt was kind of the first one to sniff it out. Um, Eric Burns was hot on the trail. Uh, <laughs> Kevin Franzen, you know, so I was doing everything I could to throw them off. And right. Be like, wow, I've heard that's a good show, man, but I've never seen it. I got I to gotta watch that. What time's that show on? Um <laughs> You know, and so, uh, and then I got a lot of flack recently for having like a LA hat on, I guess on the, there was a TV show after the mass Singer when I got masked and it had a clip of me flying home for the baby and I had a, an LA hat on. I saw it's that. just so funny. Yeah. And it's so funny cause I lived in LA for 15 years man. I love LA. It'll always be a part of kind of who I am. SoCal guy. But, uh, when I went to buy a hat, I remember I was just like in California and I went to buy a a SF hat, you know, all black and they didn't have it. So then I was like, all right, well, my second favorite city is LA. So I'm just going to do that. And I I wasn't thinking that it was going to be this funny backlash, you know? (laughs) Let's stir the pot even more, Barry. You should have worn A's hat, right? You should have just really, really threw people off. I know, man. Uh, Oh, you know, my favorite, my favorite color ever is the black A's hat, man. Back in the day, black and green. That was that's like the coolest hat ever in baseball. You had some good performances wearing that cap, got to say. <laughs> um, I guess maybe the bigger thing going on right now that we could have started with is just the whole pandemic. You mentioned um, yeah. you just became a father again now of three. Congratulations. I know you also had a birthday, but just kind of a the world situation right now, Barry. Um, how are you going through this? How are you seeing it? These are, these are interesting and scary times still. Surreal, man. Um, I think we've all fallen into the trap of going, well, when everything gets back to normal, then I'll come over for that barbecue or, you know what I mean? Right. And uh, I think that's the the thing is that we're kind of all living in the, yeah, this is just going to go away, right? And and I think slowly what I'm realizing is this is this is not just going to like one day just flip and be like, all right, we're good, guys. Right. Um, and I think that's the hard part to swallow for all of us is that this is kind of a semi-permanent change in the way we do life right now. And, um, and it does take vigilance to stay safe. I mean, I want to just go hang out with my friends and have our get togethers with family and just as much as anyone else. But, you know, you just can't be, uh, 
you know, you can't be reckless with it because yeah. people are dying and it's terrible. No, there's a obvious, there's an obvious serious side to it. Hopefully everybody takes it um, that serious as well. So you're, yeah. you're, you're busy, uh, the family, um, but the, also the business side of things. And I know you're, you're probably still working on music. I know you just had the new single come out, The Greatest. Yeah. Um, so obviously that was in, in the past, but um, in terms of keeping the music going, um, I see you're in the home studio right there. So you do have the tools to keep making music. <laughs> Oh yeah, man. I, I've, I've been waiting my whole life to build this place. And so <clears throat> I got the, I got my little, these are my little synths back there, which I love. I'm, I'm a synthesizer nerd and, uh, <laughs> didn't know I'd ever become one, but you know, uh, but yeah, you know, for me, um, I wrote this book and I finished it. And then after that, it was mm -hmm. really an opportunity to say, what do, what do I really want to do? Cause I went pretty hard into co-writing country music here in Nashville mm -hmm. and, um, learned so much through those two and a half years, worked with so many great writers and artists and, uh, you know, and now I'm really honing in even more on kind of, you know, what do I want to make in this laboratory? And of course, collaborate and have some help and stuff. So yeah. I'm working on those kind of new sounds and it's going to be definitely a departure. It's not going to be acoustic driven music. It's going to be more produced and synthesizers and, you know, drums and um, maybe like a dark, some dark stuff, uh, a little more poppy, a little dark. So, um, but all the things I love. So really I'm having such a great time trying to bring in all of the the elements and, and, and have a lot more control over the elements, you know, production wise. It's a weird thing to ask, but I've, I've been thinking about it too. Is uh, is a pandemic a good time to be creative or are you struggling to be creative right now? You know, for me, I mean, I'm always chomping at the bit to be creative, um, you know, and I think actually the pandemic and all the family time and certainly baby time yeah. has really gotten <laughs> me focused. Um, you know, when I was coming in the studio for, five, six hours a day, just kind of typical work day before the pandemic hit, I didn't find myself being as creative or as productive. And so actually this time pinch has really, you know, gotten me to be more creative in those little time constraints. So now what I'm doing is, you know, I'll be holding the baby in the middle of the night uh, and I'll have my laptop and kind of my little mobile rig um, and I'll be able to keep making tracks and stuff like that you know, with a baby in my hand, I'm kind of mastering logic one handed right now and, you know, <laughs> getting all my key commands so I can do it one handed, but, um, but still finding a way to be creative, which has been really great. So let's, let's geek out a little bit. Um, because as you know, any baseball player, any professional athlete, right, has the right equipment that they want, that they need to perform cleats or a bat or a glove or whatever it is. Sure. Uh, but now you as a yeah. musician, I'm sure there's a certain microphone you like and a certain guitar you like, and maybe an amp that you use. Tell Tell me about um, some of the specific things that, that you've kind of settled in on as, as realizing they're your favorites. Yeah, well, I started out playing guitar, probably like so many people, um, and then ultimately just wanting a little more control over the full final product. And so for me, um, I've gotten away from like more of, you know, what's my favorite guitar and, and kind of looking at the the bigger picture of, you know, how to arrange a song from front to back and, you know, how to decide on which instruments to use. And, um, you know, do we use a synth bass? Do we use a live bass? Do we use, um, you know, it, does the bass sustain over a, a four beats, you know, or is it more choppy, like a funk kind of funk bass line? So those are more of the elements that I'm focused on right now. Um, you know, more on the macro, but I think, you know, the knowledge of how every sound, um, coalesces with every other sound in the song is is really what it's about and so um like i said this this for me the new music is going to be synth driven so i have you know the analog synthesizers back there which are incredible they're a little more quirky to kind of program and get into the computer consistently so you know technology now you have all these software synthesizers right um and some of the coolest ones are like serum um Serum's incredible, and then there's this company named called Arturia, and they basically have all these, you know, analog synthesizers. Yeah, but they're they're just digital, but you bring it up, and it's like a Jupiter Eight, which is a very famous classic synthesizer. But you're looking at a Jupiter on your screen, and then you're dragging your mouse to like move the cutoff filter, and I mean, it sounds really good. You know, it's definitely not like the actual synthesizer itself, but those are the kinds of things I'm really geeking out on, and you know, how to program drum beats so they feel really organic and real, but also have that electronic quality to them. Speaking of electronics, since you just mentioned it, what do you think of EDM? <laughs> I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of it. Are you really? Um, oh, yeah. Me I mean, too, actually. 
Oh yeah. I, I mean, people, you know, uh, people give, listen, there's people who think that there's like all these live kind of like guitars, pianos and drum sets. And then there's this other thing where these guys like Martin Garrix are making that song animals, you know, right. in his bedroom when he was 16 <laughs> on a laptop. I mean, but they're, they both involve like creativity right. and musicality and they're just different tools. And so, you know, what we're seeing in music now is electronic music is really influencing what's happening on pop radio. I mean, you're seeing like legitimate drops now in pop songs. Right. Um, and for people that don't know what the drop is, you know, it's that part of the song that goes, Boom. you wait, and then, <laughs> you know, the explosion of sound. And it's so, it's so fulfilling, right, as a listener, because they, it, that, it's that tension of like the drum beats speeding up, and then it's a pause, and then it's like, oh, come on, give it to me. And then sometimes you wait for it, and then that drop happens. And so you're seeing all of that now as a result of how fun electronic music is to be a part of and to listen to in a live environment. I'm going to make sure that I play this part of our, our interview for my wife so she can hear that Barry Zito even likes EDM, all right? Because she <laughs> she and I kind of fight over that at home. That's like, it's it's already here. It's yeah, like, I you know. know uh, it's crazy. And hip-hop, too. It, yeah. These trap beats are, like, everywhere in pop yeah. music now. These hi-hats that are, you know, it's oh, yeah. like, it's all, it, it's cool how everything's just, like, you know, it's like when you mix all the Play-Doh colors and then you just have brown. <laughs> That's kind of like what is happening in music right now. Barry Zito's Trap album coming out in 2023. You heard it here first. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, from the from the pre-produced side of music and the production of it to the actual live element, I follow your Instagram. I kind of keep tabs on, you know, where you were performing. You were on tour a little bit. Um, and obviously now with the, the current state of the world, it just seems like Similar to sports, I mean, live music is essentially put on hold for who knows how long until. Any sense from you being a guy that's in that? Um, is it is it just nothing we can do and, until the world is healthy again? Yeah, I mean, I really feel that. I mean, I, I feel that, you know, that emptiness. I actually had tickets to go see Jacob Collier, who is, you know, taking over the world, basically. Um, but you know, in a couple of weeks. And so I'm, I'm feeling the void, man. I'm, yeah. the Jacob Collier is not going to happen, you know, but yeah. I think for all of us, it's, this is just a, it's just a pause. It's just a phase. Um, and I think all of us are, you know, getting impatient here, but you know, when we kind of zoom out and look at the grand, uh, you know, the great picture of our life here, this is just a little, it's a little blip. And I think for us to just continue to stay patient, you know, if we can, I mean, all these artists are doing these amazing like home concerts and living room stuff. Yeah. And, you know, charity benefits. And so, you know, as long as you have like some good headphones, you know, I would tune in and see what's going on with that. <laughs> All right. Just kind of switching gears here. Got to ask you a little, little baseball and obviously sports is going through the same thing and trying to figure out how they can come back. And you're in, you're in an interesting situation, right? Recently retired. So I'm sure you see the current player perspective, but also you're an old school guy at this point, just turned 42 years old. Um, so the rush to get back. Do you see why players want to do anything to play? But do you also see why maybe they have some reservations about their safety, compensation? How do you see one or both sides of that? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I think that the the kids that are probably in their 20s that may not have, you know, uh, close proximity to older family or to young children. Right. Maybe they don't have children in their own lives. So I think maybe those are the ones that are like, yeah, let's do this. It's cool. But then there's the other ones, you know, that have young children and babies and, uh, you know, baby parents that they're around that are older. And so it's a really tricky deal. I mean, there's, there's fallout on every side of it, certainly. But um, I think if we can just continue to follow the guidelines that we're given right now uh, on a federal level and state level, you know, that's what we can do. I mean, I, I was watching NASCAR a couple of days ago and because uh, my son's just obsessed. He has like every NASCAR little toy, you know. Yeah. And uh, but there was nobody in the stands. It was like it was really weird to see a sporting event where it literally looked like a practice session. Right? Yeah, right. Um, and I think that's kind of what we're in for. And so if, I wonder if they can figure out a way to do it so where we can still enjoy it and get it on TV and have that void filled because I feel like we all just need baseball right now. Um, that would be cool, man. We're trying. We need to, we need to put on pre and post game shows too. Uh, so I can stay <laughs> busy with it as well. Um, yes, exactly. Last thing for you here. And I want to talk about the book that, that came out prior to the recent new single that came out. But, uh, you know, in curveball, you talked about how 
baseball was your platform for so many years and and maybe even to a certain way that you know you almost kind of resent the spots that it puts you in and and it helped you find new meaning and new things in life is there ever any way that you would see yourself getting back into baseball somehow or is that literally like your book is it a closed chapter yeah well i mean for the record i never resented baseball it was really just how i interpreted it sure, because sure. i was so driven by my own toxic ego um but yeah i mean baseball is something that uh you know i'm really passionate about still you know i've just always had this other passion that i've wanted to chase but you know i'm part of this i'm, I'm on the advisory board for this um for this movement here in Nashville, uh, to bring a team here, the Nashville stars and, uh, bring a major league team here. Cause I mean, Nashville is such a thriving city. You know, I think we're ready for a major league team. Um, and it's funny, I had this kind of thing in my mind. I was like, man, what if one day in like 10 or 20 years, you know, when my kids are grown, you know, if I was like, just drive down the street and kind of like help out, you know, with the, with the local team here, that would be like super cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, speaking of the book, uh, Curveball, it's available on your website and this special offer right now, it's Barry Zito Music, correct? Barry Zito Music, yeah, dot com. And if you put in the promo code Brody, uh, which I'm very happy about, thank you very much, you get 42% off because you just turned 42 years old. So uh, 42% yes. is going to cover a, lar <laughs> a large portion of that. Uh, and obviously, I've, I, it was a while back when I got the copy and read it, but it, like I said before, it, it just... It's so many sides and stories of you that I don't know that everybody's aware of. So um, I recommend it. Obviously, BarryZitoMusic.com is where you can get it. And uh, Barry, I, I thank you for the time here right now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, man. And we have some, uh, I remember we have some cool merch too that were, it's on sale too, but we have the green and gold uh, socks. And I remember when we were making up some merch and stuff like that. I was like, man, we got to like do some socks. Like, I don't even know like, <laughs> something about those high socks, which by yeah. the way, they seem like they're just coming back. Like high socks are like cool again, which you know I how love because yeah. when I came up, man, it was like the baggy pants that were like basically look like slacks that guys had on. So now that the, the high socks, you know, here we go. We're, I think we're getting back now. Eric Chavez was the king of tucking his pants into his cleats or, or, or below the cleat. Right. So, <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> Again, Barry, really appreciate this. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Brody.